see us, right? Mm. If we're sitting down. Great. So, my first question to Anis is actually, Anis, you have screened 8,000 founders a year, you said. And you can tell a successful one, but not the successful sure. one. So can you look into my eyes and tell me if I'm going to be a successful yeah. staff founder? Of course, you're already successful. I will never tell the truth, right? <laughs> um, and also, um, so Anis has introduced himself a bit, but we have not heard anything from Fung. Um So Fung, can you tell us a bit about your background and about the Okay. Uh, well, it's going to be long, but I'll, I'll make it really short. So now I'm working on a project called Rubawa, which is basically a uh, a platform for uh, crowdfunded crowd um, design for t-shirts, basically. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's uh, applicable for general merchandise other, other than t-shirts. Um, before that, before this, basically, I was the executive director of Gabby. Um, and then before that, I was the first co-founder of the Zeta Um And before that, ECG and so on and so forth. So actually, this is uh, basically, it was it's quite a long journey, but uh, I've been spending the past three and a half years in entrepreneurship, um, and it, uh, so far so good. So far so good. Yeah, so far so good. So um, I will go back to you for on so far so good. But Anis, um, you've been in the you know venture capital for so long, um, and we would love to hear some stories, you know, personal experience. So can you tell us one of your best experience, meeting the best startup founder, and one of the worst? <laughs> <laughs> Most probably I shouldn't talk about the worst one because I've never had one. Honestly, here. To be honest, actually, it is very difficult to find an entrepreneur who has who gives you a hard time. It is difficult, right? And I have never found anyone like who has given me a hard time, and I can say that. But if I find one, maybe next time I come in, I will have one. So let me talk about the good entrepreneurs, right? Like who are really good. So I have been interested in a lot of com uh, companies from from uh, top schools, for example. So I have invested in a company called Jetlo, which actually does uh, big data. So what they do is, these are seven Stanford PhDs. They have put together this company in big data space. And big data is a very hard thing now, right? So uh, I like the team because at the very beginning, when I when I was asking them what kind of company this is, and they were mentioning that uh, we do big data analysis. And big data analysis is hardcore engineering. So my first question was, well, are you engineers? And they said, yes, we are engineers. I said, like, do you have PhDs? And they said, yes, we have PhDs. I said, like, did you go to Carnegie Mellon and Stanford? Like, yes, we went to Stanford. I said, like, you will get money from it. <laughs> because you see, if you're playing with top technology people, and if you are all engineers, I think it makes sense that, you know, you are doing it, right? If, I, if I'm doing, a, like, e-commerce, and, you know, I am a person, like, who understands this space, it, it, was, it is something that most probably I would be looking into seriously. So this um, Stanford team, which I actually invested in, uh, in, in, invested. Um, I found this team was sticking to their word all the time. Great experience. So this, these entrepreneurs, like, they gave me the plan that, you know, what they want to do. They have followed it at every single stage. I sit on their board and I have board director into the company. And you'll be surprised that if they give us a three month timeline and say that we're going to achieve this much of development, they do that. If they sh when they fundraise, if they show that you know that I am going to spend this much money, this is going to be my bond rate, they have done that. They are the most ideal startup that I can ever see. And they have received a lot of buyout offers already from different companies. And they're still growing because they think that they should be selling the company for a certain price. So this is a very ideal startup which goes by the book. It is very rare to find a startup which goes by the book, but there are people like this who goes by the book, and this is one of the startups that I can be proud of, that I really had a great experience with. Now, let me talk about not a bad, but a crazy startup, okay? 
So I invested, my first invested uh, investment uh, as a VC was in a company uh, called Lab Genius. Okay? Lab Genius, look at this company. The company changed its name to Genius. So I invested into this company and, and you know, these are three Yale graduates. Yeah, and now you will be looking to YouTube and see like, wow, these guys are crazy. Uh, their YouTubes are really crazy, uh, the videos. Uh, so these three young graduates, they actually they came up from Y Combinator, which is one of the biggest incubators in the world. Um, and I invested in this company with a valuation of $10 million. Within six months, they raised their next round. Uh, they raised $30 million from Anderson Horowitz at a valuation of $60 million within six months. And after one year after that, they raised their next round $30 million in a valuation of a billion dollars. These three people are crazy, the company is crazy, everything was crazy. In two years, I had a 100x return. And you know, when, I mean, this company is still growing, and they are, they are really growing fast. There is a lot of news on the internet about it. Even they had a big fight with Mark Zuckerberg and stuff like that. So this company is it's a lot of news. Big news, bad news. Big news, bad news. But great, great entrepreneurs. These people used to work in Google, and when they were working in Google, they found out that 2% of the world's search is done on song lyrics. So they quit Google and made this company called Rap Genius, where they find out the lyrics, the meaning of the lyrics of hip hop and rap music. And this is the company. So you might be wondering how hard it was for me to invest in a company with hip hop and rap, and rap music. I was told by my family, that, hey, you have a PhD and you are investing in that music. <laughs> so, I did that and it was a great success and I had great experiences. Okay, now I'm going to go back to full on that. So far, so good. So, you started Rupawa uh, end of last year? Yeah? Okay. So, um, tell us about this so far, so good. What? has the progress been and what were the key things that you had to make sure you had in place to reach this point? Okay, well I think so far so good. I think it means that what I'm doing now is really aligned with what I'm, you know, intended with my life. So I come from engineering background. I like tinkering with stuff, basically playing around with programs, uh, you know, hardware and stuff and stuff and figure out things. So the profession is pretty much like that. Um, and that's why I enjoyed a lot when I graduated. Um, so I spent like three years, three and a half years as a product engineer. Um, and I've been searching for more and more interesting stuff to play around basically. Um, so, um, and you know, including Rupawa. Rupawa is basically, I have a hypothesis um, that I think might work in this market given the maturity stage and so on and so forth. And um, I'm willing to try that hypothesis basically. So uh, what I'm saying so far so good means that I'm making progress. So from the initial hypothesis, I have a few that, you know, kind of disproved my initial ones. And, but, you know, we are working toward a better model. And I think um, at this stage it's much more important rather than we are not focusing, honestly, we're not focusing on traffic a lot. We're not focusing on uh, uh, so-called, uh, you know, like uh, uh, traffic and so on and so forth. It's, it's not really important at this stage. What is your focus? It's basically coming up with a solid model. We want to have the model that basically have a strong validation. If we see that, you know, like this model doesn't work, we'll, we're just going to adjust to a to more, uh, to a more uh, stable model. It's, 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 it's an evolution. So uh, we came up in the beginning, like the first three months, we didn't think about a lot about the model. We we know the MVP, and we launch it within three months. We have a commitment within 90 days. We gotta launch it, and then we collect data. I think that's the most important thing. The, the MVP is strategic enough to get all the necessary data. So now we have all those data, and it's pointing to a certain direction, uh, which we gotta test again. So now you know, like it's more like. Now we're building products to pass that hypothesis that is coming from the data, from the initial hypothesis. I'm not sure what is confusing, but you know, uh, that's the process that I like the most. Um, and yeah, so 
so far so good. <laughs> Great that you're truly enjoying the yeah. the journey, you know, the ups and downs. Because I said, you know, it's not an easy journey, right? Um, so I have a question for both of you. Um, you know, a lot of startups in Silicon Valley, um, at least one of their co-founders is a technical co-founder. Right. So do you think that that is the best kind of startup? Um, and can st startup without technical founders um, build successful startups? Um, I think it depends on the depends on what you're working on. For Rupawa, because we are a marketplace, the, the product, the website, is crucial. It has to evolve. So when the product has to evolve, there must be you know engineering skills behind it. So my co-founder is actually a CT, the, the CTO, and he is uh, handling a lot of the website development, iterating, and so on and so forth. I come from an engineering background as well. So, uh, in my business, it's really important to have technical background. But I used to come from a very, you know, like when I first started entrepreneurship, I was the co-founder of Lazada, which is basically a pure B2C market. In it. Well, it's a B2C shop, basically. It's very simple. Uh, for B2C, you can use a lot of existing, existing platforms. So the technical challenge is not as significant. There are existing solutions in the market in which you can basically quickly test the hypothesis, market quickly, and so on and so forth. Uh, in that case, it um, may not be that crucial. So uh, I think it depends. It depends on the product, really depends on the product. Uh, that's my point of view. Thank you. Uh, so in, in Silicon Valley, we are actually seeing a lot of startups who actually. Uh, so let's, let me go back. I mean, if you are a CEO and if you do not have a technical knowledge, right? I mean, can you build a startup? That's the question most probably, right? Or if you are a technical person and you are not a CEO person, how can you build a great startup? So that's a very common problem and don't worry about it. That is part of the game, right? If you are a CEO person and a good project manager, but you do not have technical skills, don't worry about it. You can either find a CTO person, right? Uh, through different network, through your school, through your uh, social network, through the incubation programs, right? Or the other thing you can do is you can actually outsource that job. We have seen a lot of Silicon Valley startups doing their development in Eastern European countries. You'll be surprised. I have found a startup who actually doing most of their development in Ukraine. Because Ukraine is cheaper than America in terms of development, and the communication skills are very good, the Ukrainian developers. Actually, the biggest development, outsourcing development house in the world is, is an IPO company in NASDAQ called EPAM. It's in Belarus. It's in Eastern Europe. Okay? So, Eastern European developers are pretty good. You can actually outsource the job there, and you can just tell them what to build, they'll build it for you. You can do that in China and India as well. These are low cost geographies. Or you can give it to the development house within Indonesia to another company. You do not need to be a technical person to be a successful startup CEO and be successful. Okay? So that's what the trend we are seeing. If you're a technical person and you do not know how to run the company, I would suggest that you hire a CEO person with a project management skill or a project management background. And you cannot outsource the project management of the CEO job to the other country, but most probably you have to find a co-founder who can actually do it. Thank you, Anis and Paul. Um, I have two more questions, and then I'll open it up to the floor. Yeah, so I'll remember you. You'll be the first. Um, my first question, um, back to Fong, is about team. Um, you know, the book, number one out of the six key items um, was team, right? So how have you been building your team? What sort of culture are you creating and how are you doing that? Okay, uh, I, I totally agree. I think team is the, the single most important thing um, in a startup. So, uh, and I agree as well. So I come from, I, I, I come from a different background, but if you ask me, can I program now with the latest 
Uh, basically, I searched for one, in, I think one year plus to get a co-founder that has the same level of understanding, that has the same vision, that has the expertise, and so on and so forth. So it's, I, I spent basically a year plus to get, uh, to get my co-founder. I had the idea of lingering for one year, one year plus, but I couldn't find somebody who uh, you know like good enough and I trust enough to actually start something. And then again, the first few employees, we both interviewed them together. I think it's quite crucial because the first few employees may be the most crucial element uh, in the beginning because the culture must fit. Um, the, the skills that we look for also must fit. So it's, I treated uh, again like you know like it's the same the same level of care with getting my co-founder. I feel that this must be the thing that can make really big changes. Um, and yeah, so the, the the mantra of highest low is true. But of course, um, once we grow bigger, the highest low must be balanced with you know there's a certain target. We gotta fill the position as soon as possible. So the compromise is, we'll look at a certain period, we'll look at the best with the best pool and hire um, And you know, just, just to get things going. Yeah, so I, I totally agree. So that's how we basically do it. My last question is to Anis. Um, you know, I love your optimism. I really, really love that you're so optimistic. Um, and you make one startup in Indonesia is going to become the next Google or Facebook based on your book and what you said. So what do these successful, you know, DECA unicorns, are they called that? Or yes. Yes. Yeah, do differently, you know, than just a, you know, regular successful, but not as successful startups. Okay, so if you want to be the next Google and Facebook, you need to actually close your eyes and think that you need to aim high Okay, I mean always I see people that discount themselves. So when I first opened my venture capital firm, I'll tell you my experience. I believed that I am going to make the biggest venture capital in the planet. That was my dream. And I can tell you, in the next three to five years, I will be managing more money than everybody can anybody can ever imagine. And I will make it happen. I'll show you. That's what my determination is. You see. That's what you should be. If you target high, when I started my firm, we started with $20 million. You know today how much money I managed? We managed close to $1.5 billion in three and a half years. That's what we have done. So what I'm trying to tell you that you should target high. If you do not target high, you cannot get there and you cannot build the unicorn. You should have bigger dreams. Don't think that you are in Indonesia and people cannot see you and you cannot do it. You are connected to the world through something called internet. You can gain customers from anywhere in the world. But you cannot just dream and the dream will become reality. You have to dream and also improve your skills. You need to remember knowledge is power. If you are not knowledgeable, you can never do it. Your dream will never become reality. Okay? So you need to improve your skills. Now to improve your skills, please remember, you cannot just rely on academic training. There are books and you have internet, right? So keep reading and keep studying. Educate yourself and level up to become the best entrepreneur. Make sense? Here you go. So, you can start with this book, but this is not the only book. I can tell you a few books that will really help you to become a better entrepreneur. For example, there is a book that I really like, it's called Lean Startup. I definitely want you to read that. The book is in English, but please read that. There is a book called Why Combinator. I really want you to read that, right? Because that book also talks about great concept. Read. If you do not read, you cannot let it up. And if you do not take your level up to the some level, you cannot you cannot get it done. I'll tell you one thing that I really feel proud about is that I was an engineer throughout my whole life, and now I teach in the business school of Stanford University. 
because I know better business than them. That makes you feel confident now? Please feel confident because you can make a difference as you practice it in your daily life. So you should do that. Great. Hajimamashite, Hajimamashite, Anzan. Uh, it's speaking in Japanese, so <laughs> nice, to you, nice to meet you all. Actually, I have one question for you. Uh, actually, it is an issue that I'm facing right now. What What do you think about single founder? What is the based on your experience? What is the success the success rate for a single founder compared to the like for for co-founder? Thank you very much. I will ask him to answer this one because he is oh, a real entrepreneur now. Thank you. Uh, and I will, I will, I will. Uh, this is solely based on my experience, but the probability of actually doing, uh, you know, like building stuff uh, alone is very, very tough. Uh, even, yeah, it's very, very tough. Because now, even with uh, two co founders in my current team, we feel all the well. And I, I can imagine the, the, the burden is like twice as much as a single uh, founder. I think the, the most challenge is you have to get somebody who you really trust, who's in, you know, who's in the same shoes as you are. And employees, the most dedicated employees are just employees, right? So um, they, 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 it's, it's just the same with co-founders because we die together. Like, it's, uh, yeah, it's just this very different feeling. Um, and yeah, I think the bottom line is very, very tough. Uh, it's much better to find. This why I spent like one plus years, uh, one plus year to get somebody to start a startup because I know that I that I can't manage a team building something that is potentially big alone. Uh, yeah, that's the that's my feeling. Well, founder is founder here also. So yeah. Come <laughs> <to> get me. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree with him that. You know, when we are investing, let me tell uh, uh, my report point of view from an investor point of view. Uh, from an investment point of view, if you are the single founder, most probably I will not invest in you. Because if you are run down by a truck or something, then I will not <laughs> Okay? Make sense? I mean, because I have to be fair with you. I mean, if you are the only person who has all the technology and stuff, and then if you, by chance, you, you become sick, I mean, you are going to take all my money with you. Right? So, it is always good to have multiple co-founders, that way the, and, and multiple people who believe in the same concept, believe in the success of the company, and that's where you get more confidence from the investors as well. So, it is very difficult, in Silicon Valley, I will tell you, it is very difficult to get money for a single, co a single founder. So, you should find people with the same mindset, who can most probably not have the same shares as you because you are the first co-founder maybe, but you can find some people of the same caliber that the investors also can rely for an answer to a question and that will give us the confidence. Okay? Awesome, thank you. Ooh, uh, you just you just have you just have a question. No girl. I think, I think no girl. Oh, right here? Okay. Girl. Yes. All right. Maybe oh, lady. Girl, girl. Oh, 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 quick, quick note yes. before I give you the question. Uh, please tweet at us. You get the free books in the back. Also, Nas, can you want up the t-shirt? Yeah, 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 yeah. So normally, the person who answers the question first gets a t-shirt. If you're brave enough, confident enough to answer, ask the first question, get a t-shirt. But I don't know, Nas, I'm gonna hold this up real quickly. Hold it up, hold it up, hold it up. Show everybody. Ooh la la. No, uh, if, you can, if you can answer us after this, the three, the, probably three of the six most important things uh, out of the book that matters to any startup, you get the free t-shirt. Okay, so you have to chase down uh, Pierre uh, and answer to him, and then he'll decide who gets to share. But anyways, back to the question. My name is Danis Mestiono. I want to ask you about venture capital. Uh, I make uh, I make a construction business, and I did. I want to ask you about uh, this. Silicon Valley always uh, fund, uh, fund, give a fund to IT company or they also give to construction company. Thank you. 
So here's a good question. His question is, in Silicon Valley, do we only invest in IT company or also we invest, can we also invest in a construction company? Correct? So in Silicon Valley, there are different types of investor. In my firm, we invest in IT company. So it has to be technology, it has to be information, it has to be something with the internet, okay? But there are some VCs who actually invest in hardware, like construction and, and real estate and stuff. So there are also PE firms, like private equity firms, who actually invest in construction projects. So most probably, if you look into, talk to a PE firm, you will have a better luck of getting funded uh, versus a venture capital. And that's your question? Uh, I think it's lady. Right? Cool. Yes. Hello. My name is Sally. I have to remember me when I talk about Facebook. And last year, you mentioned opportunity to be my angel investor. Yes, my name is Sally. Please remember me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You mentioned, you mentioned about criticism, about sending criticism from your um, consumers once you launch your product. So I'm asking you, how do you know which criticism that you receive is the biggest criticism you need? Because I don't want my startup company to be vulnerable and be adjusted as some people criticizing. Okay, so I think it's a good question. That she's saying that, how do I know which criticism to take, which feedback to take? Let's just not call the word criticism. It's a tough word. So let's call it like feedback, okay? So which feedback to take, which not to take, right? So I think you need to talk to a bunch of people rather than one or two people and then find out that what is the most common feedback you're getting. I think you need to do the sampling here. Sampling by what I mean is you're talking to 10 people and if seven people told you the same thing, most probably you need to fix that. But if one person is telling you to fix something, most probably you should not make a decision right away. So you need to talk to more people and do the sampling and that's how you actually make sure that you are changing the product based on a common feedback that you are getting from multiple people. Make sense? So I think sampling is the answer for you that this is what I need to change, this is what I do not need to change. Did I answer your question or did I not understand? <laughs> Funk, Funk, did you actually have any words on that? Because you're on the startup right now, so I think you have pretty good insights. I, th I think it's a, I think it's really true. Like if you, if, you know, if one person says something about your product, yeah. it's an opinion. But two, three, consistently saying the same thing, it probably is true, right? So I think it's the it, simple way of saying if too many people feeling that there's a certain aspect of your product is change or improvement, take it as a, you know, like, you know, it's, it's a real feedback. You don't like, you know, like go to person one. Thank you. So we'll do a couple more questions, but I'll go to this side of the room real quickly. I saw, I saw, well, he was on this side of the room, because there's a, I'll go, I'll go back here really. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cody. Uh, I'm a population of Tibet. My simple question is actually as a PR practitioner, some journalists asking to me about how to reach the startup, the startup. And, and I want to ask you, is it important for us, uh, for, for us, to get a conventional PR because most of startups they do digital PR but actually uh, my question is directly like is it important for startup founder to put their name on Compass or Media Indonesia or the newspaper, the name of the newspaper? How important for them to, to, to do that? Thank you. So if, if I understand your question correctly, you're saying that how important it is for putting how important it is for you to put your name on big newspapers, right? So again, it depends on where you are, okay? If you're just building the product and it's not complete, then it might not make sense to put your name on Compass. It is going to be a dis distraction for you. If your product is, has launched and you are trying to find users to use it, it will make sense to put your name on Compass, okay? 
So please make a judgment on when to put your name on the newspaper and make a big slash about it, splash about it, so that people you can get more users, right? So I think it's the timing most probably. And then as a CEO, you have to make the judgment on when is the right timing for you for your startup. But marketing actually is a very good thing for a startup once you have a full running product. So any kind of marketing opportunity you get, I mean don't say no directly, but say that hey, can I do it later? Because you are you are relying on the mercy of a lot of people, right? Because you want to build the friendship, you need to live with the ecosystem. So if you get an offer today and you're not ready, please tell them that can you do it in a later date, maybe after three months when your product comes out. So never refuse the opportunity, always end in a good note. That would be my advice. Okay? Fung, would you like to say anything? Yeah. That would be good? Okay, one, one, probably one last question. Hi, my name is Andre. Uh, probably this question more to uh, Anne. Thank you so much for your sharing and your presentation as well. Um, it's about the sharing economy. Uh, you know about the successful sharing economy in Uber, Airbnb in the US. Uh, how's the challenge in the region based on your view? Because I know Uber doesn't actually pack up in the region, so it probably has made more challenging as well in here. So I just want to know from your perspective, from your point of view, about the sharing economy, like peer to peer network for the consumption startup in Indonesia. So if I understand your question correctly, that what are the challenges of shared economy business in Indonesia? Okay, perfect. So let me tell you about the challenge of shared economy business in general, okay? Because I think uh, everywhere in the world is facing the same problem. So with shared economy, let's let be more precise. Let's use Uber, okay? I also invested in a shared economy company called Sidecar, which is most probably the number three player in, in shared economy. Um, so I invested that in Union Square in New York. Um, so the main challenge that you face with shared economy is that you have to bend the rules and regulations of country and you have to fight with the government, you have to fight with the city corporation, you have to fight with the prefecture, you have to fight with the governor of the state, right? Because you see, for example, with Uber, the problem is that taxi drivers are driving taxi and then you know regular people are going to do the same thing so what happens to the job of these taxi drivers, right? So it is a big threat and they are going to complain to the government and the government will think that, you know, I'm going to take away food from some very poor people, right? And they are going to try to protect them. So that is the problem with the shared economy. I mean, it is, from the consumer point of view, it definitely makes our life better, but it is definitely a big breakthrough from the traditional style of living that you have lived through for hundreds of years, right? So that is the biggest problem in anywhere you go, and I'm sure that that is some problem that you will be facing in Indonesia as well, and in any other country. Wonderful. Well, I think with that, I think we can conclude the event. Thanks, guys. Big round of applause.